Today's topic, Australia's greatest aviation mystery. And Rhonda and I have been discussing this for a long time. What happened to Frederick? It's quite a saga. It's quite a story. I can see so many people here know the story and we're going to be getting right into it. I put my name and phone number. I didn't put Rhonda's up there, but if you want to get any contact with Rhonda, please contact me and I can get that on to Rhonda. But the disappearance of Frederick Valentich, and can you believe that it's nearly 46 years ago, coming up in October, Saturday the 21st of October, 1978. Now today we're going to be going back through quite a bit of history. Uh, we've got Rhonda that can give uh, a very good amount of history to both families. Uh, what happened on the day and then the aftermath and I'm strangely connected to this whole thing and I've felt deeply connected for a long time because I was a struggling pilot just like Frederick Valentich. I went through all the things he was going through, the failures, the disappointments, the challenges on my way to trying to get into commercial aviation, which I did and I'll tell you about that uh, shortly. So uh, then, you know, you know, what happened? This is such a mystery. And we were talking about it, Australia's greatest aviation mystery. And what really sets it apart is a five minute, 50 second radio transmission to Steve Roby and Melbourne Flight Service describing what was happening to him. Never been anything else like that in Australia, New Zealand or PNG. And we've come, Rhonda and I have become very close to Steve Roby, the um, flight service unit operator. And uh, I'll share with you after some thoughts that he has put together on this. I've been close to him for a long time. She's been close to him since 46 years, basically. And we'll show you some slides and things about that. The other thing is no wreckage. Usually when an aeroplane crashes, there's plenty of wreckage, but there's nothing. So, we will move on. How did Frederick Valentich vanish? And the whole story, the whole saga of Saturday the 21st of October 1978. What a mystery. Now, you would remember this saga 22 months after Frederick went missing, another human being went missing at Ayers Rock. Ironically, I went up to fly the out back in 1975 and we used to land right next to the Ayers Rock. I was flying for Sartas, a charter company, then in the right-hand seat of a DC-3 for Conair, Canalans. And we'd land right there and we saw the dingoes. We knew they were dangerous. But the worst thing about this uh, whole saga was what they put that family through. It was terrible, sort of like a witch hunt. And then we, it destroyed the family really. And because there was so much scuttlebutt lies, uh, innuendo, misinformation, rumors, false stories, but there was about the same amount of stuff came out with Frederick and still is. And a lot of the time you'll go onto YouTube or you'll look on the internet and some of the videos, they're so, inaccurate and so we're going to help uh, hopefully clear up some of these inaccuracies today and afterwards you can ask questions after we've done the session be able to speak to us after and uh, and bring up anything that you'd like to bring up it was amazing the stuff that was published in the paper anything to sell a story don't let the facts get in the way of a good story and that top one, Pilot's Girl Goes in Vain to Rendezvous. A major Australian pub, um, paper published this about Rhonda, 16 years of age. She had planned to go on a secret rendezvous that night to a motel. What a lot of bunkum. She came from a very decent family, a Christian family. There was nothing like that was ever intended. But they put it in there to sell papers. Some should be ashamed of themselves. Ron, we'll talk about that. Frederick, wow, what a great photo. 20 years of age, in his uniform, 
you can see dedication, persistence, drive, determination. He was working to get his way slowly from a private licence to a commercial licence, a senior commercial licence, maybe into an airline. And he had his challenges along the way, and we'll be talking about that. But I think that's a, a terrific photo of a very presentable young man, 20 years of age. OK, let's have a little look at the story on a video, not totally accurate, but it goes for four minutes. October 21st, 1978. At 6.20 p.m., Fred climbed aboard a rented Cessna 182 single-engine plane for a routine cargo flight. Common occurrence in a vast country where light aircraft are a regular form of transportation. The plan to pick up an order of crayfish. The flight should have taken just over an hour. Conditions were good, visibility was clear, and the plane was regularly serviced. His planned route took him over the outskirts of Melbourne, past Cape Otway, to King Island in the Bass Strait. Initially, the flight seemed normal, as Fred spoke to Melbourne Flight Service Officer Steve Rogan. Well, he just made a standard position report over Cape Otway with an estimate for King Island. Um, I think he said he was operating below 5,000, and that was it. 45 minutes into the flight, there began an extraordinary exchange. Steve Roby was the last person to speak to Fred. To this day, he's still shaken by the memory. This is a transcript of the beginning of their remarkable conversation. Frederick said, Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. Is there any known traffic below 5,000? I said, Delta Sierra Juliet, no known traffic. I uh, got him to describe the aircraft. It is four bright, it seems to me like landing lights. Then he said, the aircraft has just passed over me at least a thousand feet above. He was describing it doing some fairly strange things. He's flying over me two, three times at speeds I could not identify. Frederick then said, Tell Sarah Julia that the engine's run by me. I've got to say 2324. And, and, and it just caught me. Rough island that the engine could have had mechanical problems, potentially fatal above the sea. Steve Roby can recall Fred's fear as if it was yesterday. Just listening to him, I can still remember it distinctly. Um, the way he was speaking to me in a broken communication, form of uh, hesitant communication, he definitely sounded uh, as if he was under stress. And I could just picture him sort of in the aircraft looking around at this object in the sky. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne, coming over. Four minutes later, the radio went dead. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne, coming over. Fred never arrived at King Island. Okay, so there's the mystery, and uh, some people say, well, what happened to him? No wreckage, no body. Is he dead? I can't say he's dead because there's no evidence of that. But we'll move on and say, who was Frederick Valentich? He was born Sunday the 9th of June 1958, 
and there's no one better to tell us about Frederick than Rhonda Rush. Uh, Frederick Valentich was born in Australia on the 9th of June in 1958. Uh, his parents Guido and Alberta Valentich were immigrants from Italy and came from Trieste, which is northern Italy. In Australia, they settled in Avondale Heights, which is west of Melbourne, and they had three children. The first born was Fred, and always called him Freddie by his family. Uh, next was a boy uh, named Ricky, and later they had twin girls named Olivia and Lara. They all were a very happy and close family, and all spoke Italian at home. The kids were very lucky. They had both their grandparents on both sides living nearby. And when I went to visit them five years ago, one grandmother was still alive. Uh, Fred wasn't, a gra wasn't great at school, maybe because English uh, was his second language. Uh, but neither was I and many others. Um, he loved ri uh, riding off-road motorbikes and he, uh, got his father to take him to Essendon Airport, sorry, microphone, Essendon Airport um, many weekends to watch planes land and take off. And he told his father he was going to be a pilot at a young age. Um, Guido worked at GMH, which is also known as General Motors Holden. And uh, he was a draftsman there, and that's what, what he did. And Fred's first job was at GMH, but working in the foundry. And it must have been hot, hard work. Um, Alberta worked as a seamstress, and Fred became an Air Force cadet. Uh, he tried to join the Air Force, but failed his entry exam. So with the help of his father, he got him his C CPL, which is commercial pilot. Oh, no, got his private pilot's license. Oh, private. Yeah pilot's license. Um, he worked as hard as he could to get money just to go flying because he loved it so much. And many times as he could. Um, he got a job at the Army Disposal Store in Mooney Ponds in Melbourne and he loved that job, meeting people, serving customers and got on really well with his boss. Uh, Fred was a tall, six foot, handsome Italian man. <laughs> And uh, to me, uh, was very handsome, especially when he was in his uniform. <laughs> um, he was very funny. Um, he enjoyed and loved his life and his family. He was very honest, polite, had manners and common sense. He always opened every door for me. He was a true old fashioned gentleman. Um, he had been handpicked by squadron leader Ronald Grandy uh, to be an air training instructor at 16 Flight Headquarters in North Melbourne. He volunteered tiered every Friday night and that's where I met Frederick. So that's a bit about Frederick. So what's next on our well, list? Well, the, well the, I'll show some, I'll show some uh, more slides. So we've got Alberta and young Fred there at a Christmas photo. Looks like a loving mother and a lovely little boy. And that's uh, Frederick with Ricky, his little brother. And they are eight years apart or six years apart? Six. Uh, Fred and Ricky. He was 19 and Ricky was 12. When he 12. Went. Not a, okay. when he went about seven years apart and they were great mates. And that one, Rhonda, is in his cadet's air cadet's uniform. Um, and you could see tall, good-looking young man heading in a positive direction. There's a bit of a close-up of Frederick. That's with his father's car. Yep, that's uh, out the front of my house. Out the front of Rhonda's house. When he come around the, did you take that photo? Yeah. yeah. And of course at Moorabbin, and uh, he's got a, a Cessna there, looks like a 172 because it doesn't have cowl flaps. 
and we'll get on to a, a little bit about cowl flaps a little bit later into it, but you can see in this aeroplane, cowl flaps are usually about here to let the air in when you're climbing and uh, taking off and the air out to keep the engine cool. Just a little door that opens uh, there. So that looks like a 172 to me. Okay, so the next thing is, who is Rhonda Rushton? Thank you. I was born at Merriweather, New South Wales, in Newcastle. Um, but I was only there for a week uh, when my new parents came to get me, Ruth and Ray Rushton. They, they came from Melbourne and already had a son named Ross Rushton. They had adopted Ross and myself from the same mother, but different father. So Ross is my half-brother and five years older than me. We were the four double R's, Ruth, Ray, Ruth, Ray, Ruth, Ross and Rhonda Rushton. We lived in Preston, which is the northern suburbs of Melbourne. My dad had drove a delivery truck for Hutt and Small Goods. Um, and mum was a housewife. Um, we had a good and happy upbringing. Ross was a mummy's boy and I was daddy's little girl. I did everything with my dad and as a son would, <laughs> but I was a real tomboy anyway. Uh, dad taught me everything. One of our favorite things was fishing together. I was never good at school. The only thing I was good at was sports. Any sports, uh, short distance running was my favorite. And I also broke the long jump record at my school. Um, also, I was very good at swimming and diving. Um, my sports teacher once said to me, with some training, I might be good enough for the Olympics. I would always get A's for physical education, but my parents wouldn't recognise that as uh, sport as a subject. <laughs> I left school at 15, uh, because I wasn't going anywhere at school. <laughs> so I left school at 15 and I got a job in a chemist and I was so happy I was working. Leaving school was the best thing for me. I stayed at my first job for six months. My boss's wife, left him and uh, he had four children to look after and all he did was complain to me every day. So I got another job. <laughs> um, I ended up getting another job in a bigger chemist um, with a better boss and other staff to work with because that first chemist, it was just me and that boss, you know, the, the pharmacist. So it was um, good. The second job was much, much better. I was now 16 and that, that's the job I had when I met Fred. So that's pretty much about me up to, you know, when I met Fred. We'll change microphones. There's a delightful photo. Rhonda, this photo, when was that taken? Oh. That was one of our night out, uh, nights out. Um, that was at Babes Disco um, at the Chevron Hotel in St Kilda Road, corner of St Kilda Road and Commercial Roads yeah. in Melbourne. Um, a newish disco, and in those days they'd come around and take photos of you. Mm. Yeah. It's a lovely photo. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a happy young couple. Out in, in, Rhonda's so expressive, isn't she, in, in that <laughs> the Fred's a little bit more staid. And, uh, and there he is. Rhonda loves this photo because he's smiling. Yeah. And uh, the other one, she's pretty, pretty well in, in business mode. And here he is in other photos in the uh, Air Training Corps. See, Fred was battling battling at school because he found studying and learning difficult. I did too. I had followed the same path. I was a failure at school, but it was only my love of flying that precipitated me in learning how to learn and pass exams. So I identify with what Fred was going through. 
but he certainly found his niche in the Air Training Corps and you can see him well presented in the middle at the back there, a very good looking happy young man and even though he'd been refused entrance into the Royal Australian Air Force twice um, because educational background, well it wouldn't have been easy living at home, Italian is the the first language in the family and English a second language and he's got to then adapt uh, to everything in English so it wouldn't have been an easy journey for him but that's a lovely photo of him there in happy days and here he is in another one and uh, can you pick him in there up the back and uh, second from the right well second from my right looking at it and uh, so he was certainly uh, a well-respected, very valued member of that Air Training Corps. Now, I was looking at this photo and I couldn't find him. I looked everywhere. <laughs> Which one? And, th and then I saw the bloke in the different coloured uniform because he was the instructor of these by young then, fellows. Yeah, by then he was the instructor. By then he was the instructor. So he was certainly making any problems he had with education, he was overcoming. And if he had have continued, he would have followed a similar path that I was lucky enough to follow. The squadron leader, Ronald Grandy, said Frederick Valentich was handpicked as an Air Training Corps instructor by, well, by Ronald Grandy. Frederick was level-headed, could hold his tongue, was no fool, and he was common sense on two legs. And a lot of bad stuff has been written about him and about problems that he had. But here's the fellow that was uh, squadron leader, his comment about him. And uh, Edwin Robert Barnes, the squadron leader attached to the Air Training Corps where Fred, Frederick was studying, uh, just reported that Frederick was of sober habits. He wasn't into drugs, he wasn't into alcohol. If he went out somewhere, he'd have one drink uh, and that'd be it. But he just, his whole motive from 12 was to learn to fly and achieve a commercial license and go flying commercially. So he was a uh, common sense on legs. That's a pretty good recommendation, isn't it? So who am I? Well, I was born January 1949. Yes, I am that old. And uh, learned to fly at age 16. My life changed. I was a failure at school. My life changed at 14. I was attending a Church of England and the local minister really good man and his wife said, would you like to go for a fly today? I was living at Cranbourne in Victoria and 10 miles away there was a minister who had his private pilot's licence, Mr Eggleston, and took me on that first flight in 14. And I got totally captivated by the feeling of freedom in aviation. And I can still, it's amazing the memories that we have, I can still see that flight in my mind's eye and that's a long time ago. That so it'd be about uh, 64. And um, so I found out you could learn to fly at 16. I pestered my dad all day, the day I turned 16, to take me to Rabin, and he didn't, he wouldn't. But persistence pays off. Frederick had persistence, and I had persistence. And finally, he took me to the airport at 4.30 that summer's afternoon. And uh, ironically, he knew the bloke that owned the flying school I learned to fly at 16. Uh, I had a really bad year at school. I was failing um, exams very badly. And because I hadn't learnt how to learn, this is what they don't teach you at school sometimes, how to learn, how to go about it. And we all have different learning methods. And uh, so I, I ended up um, thinking that I could never get a commercial licence, but step by step, like Fred, I did. Had a commercial licence at 20. And, uh, or 21, and the instructor's rating at 22. And I went flying, uh, instructing for a few years, and then in 75 up to the Northern Territory, flying the outback in twin engine aircraft. And uh, then I've got a letter at home saying I was too old for ANSET at 28. They had a cut off line, they couldn't get away with it today, could they? But I was too old at 28, and believe it or not, persistence pays off. I got in at 32. Um, I logged over 19,000 hours and flew for ANSET for 20 years. ANSET crashed, but I didn't. So 
so that was good. And um, 19 years flying a lovely Boeing 737. And that's the route that Fred would have taken. His persistence would have got him through, I'm sure. And you could just see from those, those photos. So I can talk about the flight, the day, the search, everything else from my personal point of view. And Rhonda's her story. Well, there's in answer, and I, you pick which one is me, and I'm not wearing a skirt. So we've got Michelle Hall there, we've got Howard Keyes, the captain there, Vera Lata there, and that's me when I was young, or younger. But it was great flying the 737 with great crews, good fun, and done safely. And Australia's just got touch wood since they brought in pure jets in 1964, there hasn't been one fatal commercial airline accident in Australia. And that's no accident because of very high standards. Now, I've got some interesting fellows to introduce you to. And uh, Arthur Shutt at the Shutt Flying Academy where I learned to fly and someone wrote a book, The Life of Arthur Shutt, forwarded by Sir Reginald Lancet and it was written by Wal Davies. Now, Arthur was quite a character, a very experienced pilot. He got the franchise for Cessna aircraft in both Victoria and Tasmania. And uh, I learned to fly there, and then I went down to a place called Tyab on the Western Port on the Mornington Peninsula. I met this character, and ironically, this is his funeral um, notice many years ago, but he was a heavy smoker and died at about 73 of lung problems, Bill Val. And when I met him, he had, this is his first aeroplane, a Tiger Moth, and boy, was he a daredevil. He was unbelievable. And uh, quite a char likeable character, and he has, must have had not a truckload of money, a trainload of money, because he came, I think his father was very well to do. And you know, uh, I think his father had shares in a gold mine, which he did very well out of. But he bought the airfield, he built a 32 unit motel, squash courts, licensed restaurant, built hangars, got a fleet of aeroplanes and had three jet helicopters, all new from America. One of them was the first ambulance helicopter in Australia, the Angel of Mercy. And that was established in about 1972. So what's that got to do with Frederick Valentich? A lot because that was the first Cessna that Bill Val bought, and I was at um, Moorabbin the day he bought it from Arthur Shutt, and uh, he didn't take delivery of it because it still smelt of sheep, because a farmer owned it and it had to be cleaned again before he'd take delivery on it. So I was down one Sunday morning at Tyab, and Bill Val had this aeroplane, and he said, do you want to come for a flight? We're going to look for someone that's lost in Bass Strait. So I jumped in the back seat there as an observer. Bill was flying from this seat. On the other seat was a British lady, Margaret Wright, and uh, Greg Skinner was on the other back seat. We flew across to Portsea on the back beach on Bass Strait. We didn't know what we were looking for, who we were looking for. We flew up and down around for 40 minutes looking for this lost diver. We got back to uh, Tyab. And this is Sunday morning, December the 17th, 1967. The missing Prime Minister, Harold Holt. So it's quite amazing that Bill Vale had a connection to both losses in Bass Strait. Harold Holt, and that was in uh, Cafe 63's menu recently. They featured Harold Holt. And the very next year, Bill Vale traded that Cessna uh, 175 Skylark 1961 model in on this brand new aircraft, DSJ, the very one that uh, Frederick went missing in. And uh, you might, I don't know whether you can pick up the, there's a cow flap just under here, but beautiful aeroplane. If you learned to fly in a Cessna, it was usually in a 150, a little two-seater aircraft. Then you might go to the four-seater aircraft, the 172. The 182 had a more powerful motor and it had an ability to change the pitch on the propeller, a constant speed unit, because in takeoff it was more efficient if you had it in fine pitch. As you got into cruise, 
you'd course in the pitch on the propeller. And it was a fantastic aeroplane to fly and a great performer. I got endorsed on that when it was brand new on December the 9th, 8th and 9th, 1968. And just loved flying that aircraft. They logged over 110 hours in it. So you can imagine I felt pretty close to the Frederick when he went missing in the same aircraft. So there it is, DSJ, all aircraft, Australian aircraft have VH, that's the Australian designation, Delta Sierra Juliet, a 1968 Cessna 182L, bought from Shutt Aircraft by Bill Val, the owner of Val Air Services. And that's in about 1970 taken from a grainy old video 8 uh, that my sister took just after I'd taken her flying in DSJ with her family down at Tyburn on a very overcast sort of winter's day. And lo and behold, last year I see uh, Cafe 63 even featured Frederick on their menu up here. And the last five words of that, tra that uh, message to Steve Roby, it's that aircraft is hovering above me and it's not an aircraft. Wow. Never been another message like that, has there, with a description of five minutes, 50 seconds, and then he says, but he was very professional in how he conducted himself on the radio. Um, Bass Strait and Tasmania, very dangerous waters. And this book, um, written by Kevin uh, Kiley, Amazing book. Yeah, Rhonda lent it to me and Gary Lester. They vanished without trace, victims of the strange forces of Bass Strait. But Bass Strait can get very rough. And I looked up on the Wikipedia and there are a list of ships, about 18 good sized ships that have gone down, one with 400 people on board, all lost. And uh, so it said in the book that there are over a thousand ships and boats gone down in Bass Strait over the years. So that's, that's quite, a, quite a loss. A lot of aeroplanes, a lot of aeroplanes as well. And aircraft, there have been, a few, um, a, during um, World War II, uh, training flights that had gone missing, the RAF training flights without answer, and close encounters of an Australian cold, the UFOs, the image hypothesis, but. Keith Bastaville, he's from uh, South Australia. So there's a fair amount of documentation there. But um, Rhonda, I think um, it might be best now for you to, to describe, you were going on the flight, well, I'll hand back to you and you can tell us what happened on the day. Okay, um, on the day, well, the Friday night before... Oh, well, we better go back a little yeah. bit how you met. <laughs> yeah, that might be better if we start there. That's quite a story. <laughs> um, I, how I met Fred, um, I had a friend called Peter Quinn and he was my neighbour's nephew. Uh, he used to come and visit, of course, his auntie, and he would always come over to mum and dad's house. And he would, um, uh, you know, just come and visit. Uh, and my mum used to always say, oh, Peter only comes over because, you know, I think he likes you, you know. So anyway, um, I used to, we, I'd go out with Fred, uh, not Fred, uh, Peter. I'd go out with Peter um, with my girlfriend and um, quite often actually we used to use Peter because he had a car. So he'd get us to wherever we wanted to go. But Peter was also um, a funny person. He was one of those that wanted to uh, get into the Air Force or Police Force anything that had a uniform. And Peter was one of those that we 
be in the car, we're going somewhere, and if a police car or an ambulance went past, Peter would follow <laughs> and then try to, like, assist. <laughs> right. He was also one of those who would have the same kind of car as the police did at the time. So if the police changed their cars, he'd update it. Yeah, <laughs> it's very strange. But anyway, um, he would put his um, Air Force cap because he, he volunteered too at North Melbourne in, you know, the cadet, with the cadets. And um, he would put his uh, Air Force cap on the back, you know, shelf in the car like the police would do, you know, and uh, he would... Uh, yeah, so anyway, Peter, one night, one day came over to my place and he said, would you be interested in just coming out for the night and going down to North Melbourne headquarters and have a look around? And I go, yep, yeah, because something to do. Uh, <laughs> when you're young, you know, get out of the house. Um, so I went with him that night down to North Melbourne to 16 Flight headquarters and that's where... Uh, they trained the cadets. And so we got there and uh, we walked in and Peter said, well, I better first take you to the office um, and to let, it was Ronald Grandy who was in the office and he, uh, squadron leader, he, he uh, Peter said, we better tell him that you're on the premises. All right, so um, we went to where the office is and it was a very, 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 narrow corridor down to this office and I know what I can remember one side of it was all glass you could see outside and the other side was just a wall but it was it was very narrow you know like if you had to pass someone in that corridor you had to sort of go you know onto the side and pass each other so anyway we're Peter and I are walking down the corridor and um as we're halfway down, uh, the door at the end opens and out came someone, well, it was Fred, came out of the office and he sort of came up to where we were and, of course, we, we had to do that. We had to sort of stand, you know, I was against the window side, Fred was standing against the wall, Peter was in front of me and uh, Peter introduced us, um, you know, Fred, Rhonda, Rhonda, Fred, uh, and... I can remember just looking at Fred, but he was just like, you know, still looking back at me and it was just sort of staring at each other. And then um, he went, he said, oh, well, they talked a little bit and um, Fred said he had to go, but he said to Peter, uh, are you coming to the dinner dance uh, tomorrow night, the same building? And Peter said, oh, I don't know if I will, you know, and... Pete and Fred said, well, why don't you ask Rhonda to come to the dinner dance and uh, go and get some tickets, you know, it'll be a nice night, you know. And Peter said, oh, yeah, maybe, you know. So anyway, Fred went, walked off. I, I was walking back to the, to the door of the office to meet um, Ronald Grandy and um, I turned around and at the same time, Fred turned around and looked at, we just looked at each other. So it was like, you know, that, that connection, you know. So uh, anyway, went and saw, met Ronald Grandy and then Peter continued taking me around the building, showing me things in the building, pe meeting people. And then we saw Fred again later and he was in the middle of training some of the cadets. So we watched that for a little bit. And then uh, Peter went off and got the tickets for the dinner dance. And uh, to this day, I can thank Peter <laughs> for getting the tickets, but introducing me to Fred. And um, so the next night was the dinner dance and Peter came and picked me up. I got, you know, dressed up and uh, we went to, again, North Melbourne headquarters and we went inside and it was all done up. It was so nice. Um, for me being young, 16, it was such a good night because I had these big long tables, you know, going from one end to the other of the hall and had, you know, beautiful um, table, white tablecloths and, you know, it was very, very nice, the cutlery and everything and, you know, flower dis 
lays on the tables and and it was a, f a full uh, full house of people in there. And so I didn't know anyone except for Peter. So I, I sat next to Peter and um, I was talking to the people around me, you know. And then I looked down the table and I saw Fred further down the table and he was looking at the same time up to where, he, to where I was sitting. And um, so Peter was, you know, he never could sit still, you know. So off he went, get a drink, and then came back and then he'd asked me for a dance or so had a dance with him. And then someone else, uh, I think, came up and asked me for a dance, had a dance with them. And then um, when I sat back down, I looked back down the table and, and Fred had moved up the table, uh, just, you know, a bit further down, but, you know, getting closer up to where we were. And uh, he was talking to some people there. And then I think, Peter, uh, Peter went off, get another drink, came back, and Fred had worked his way around the table to next to me where Peter's seat was. Peter came back with the drinks and said, you know, Fred, get up, that's my seat. And Fred said, well, go and grab another seat and sit, next, you know, like behind us. <laughs> Fred wasn't going to move. So Fred ended up staying there. He didn't move anymore along that table. He just sat next to me. And then, um, so anyway, the funny thing about it, uh, we, we were having a wonderful night, lots of dancing, lots of talking, you know, it was really good, meeting a lot more people. And uh, the funny thing about it, Peter was also had a, um, it was a, like a beeper thing. I know it was a, a pager. A pager, yeah, it was a pager. And um, he... He, because of what I said before with him, with the police and the, you know, and the ambulance, he used to tell everyone, you know, it was really important they'd page me, you know, if, if they needed me, you know, things like he'd tell people, you know. So I knew the real reason. The real reason was his mum was very sick and she would page him if she needed him, right? And that was the only reason he had this pager. So anyway, um, Fred somehow knew the phone number to that pager, right? So Fred got up, he goes, I'm going to get a drink. Next minute, minute Peter's pager goes off, right? Pretty smart Fred, right? He comes back to the table when uh, Peter goes, I've got to go. The pager's gone off, I've got to go. And he said, you're coming, Rhonda? And I go, well, you know, I'm having a good time. And, and Fred just goes, oh, look, she's having a really good time. I'll take her home. Right, so uh, yeah, it was pretty cunning, pretty smart, and he ended up taking me home that night, and we exchanged phone numbers in the car. And um, he he said, "Oh look, I've got a busy week ahead. I've got a few exams with uh, my flying." He said, "I'll probably ring you next weekend." And then Sunday morning, I think it was about nine o'clock, the phone rang, and it was Fred. He couldn't wait, wait another week. So we talked on the phone for about three hours and we'd only just met. So we were very, had a lot of things in common in a way, you know, and we talked really well together. And I can remember my mum telling me off, like, um, get off the phone, you've been on there too long. And I'm thinking, well, who's gonna ring us on a Sunday morning? You know, <laughs> like, why do I have to get off the phone? And so, um, Anyway, uh, I, I went out for my first date with Fred the following Saturday night and he took me out to a restaurant and we got to know each other again even more. And then um, I think a week later he took me flying in uh, Cessna and um, I loved it. And I, I was always a bit of a daredevil anyway, so I loved all those kind of things. Anyway, he took me uh, on many flights. Uh, we actually probably flew every weekend, and even it was just an hour because, you know, it cost a bit of money, and his dad would give him the money. If not, he would have to find that money, you know, through work or whatever to go flying. But he would try to go every weekend, and even if he just hired the plane for an hour, 
you know, and I'd be always be with him in nearly every flight that he went on. Um, aerobatics. Oh yeah, he took me aerobatic flying, so it just goes to show you uh, how he was a good pilot. He knew how to do aerobatics, and he took me aerobatic flying. We only did it once, but <laughs> it was fantastic. You know, we did loop the loops, and you know, I think he even did a, um, a depth dive. Uh, where you, uh, yeah, where you spin, you know, and then put the engine back on, you know, and yeah, I, I wasn't scared. He had all the confidence of what he was doing. So, um, yeah, he took me aerobatic flying. He asked you where we'd like to go to, and you said Newcastle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one, one time when we were going to go flying, he, um, he said to me, where would you like to go? And now I look back on it, and I probably shouldn't have said what I said, but I wanted to go to Newcastle to visit my uncle up there. And he was my favourite uncle, and I wanted him to meet Fred, you know. And so Fred, of course, would go, yes, you know, no problems, you know, and not thinking at the time that that's a long way, you know, before, before, for Fred, you know, to fly and... Um, but we had no problems. We flew up there. Um, we landed at uh, Aeropalatin Airport, which is very small. You know, just it just has small planes land there. And my uncle lived at Spears Point, um, which is uh, Lake Lake um, Macquarie. Macquarie. Thank you. Um, yeah, just right on the lake there. And he came and got us, a bit of a shock, you know, I rang him up and said, oh, guess what, I've come to visit. <laughs> and uh, he came and got us, took us back, chatted for ages. Um, ended up, it got late, and I did not realise that Fred couldn't fly at night at that stage. You know, he didn't have the instrument rating for night flight. So we had to stay the night and um, go back the next day. Uh, so I had to ring Mum. <laughs> and dad and tell them oh guess where i am <laughs> and we're yeah she was a bit shocked that we we're up at newcastle and so we stayed the night it was really good next day went to get the plane and aeropelican was just like a paddock really had no fence um at the time and so uh I think some kids had got to the, some of the planes that night, you know. One of the planes had, had been vandalised, or not a lot, but, you know, just played around with. So the guy said to Fred, you know, just check your plane, double check it, make sure that it's okay. Um, so he, he did, and, and Fred was one of those that every time we went flying, you know, he'd do his checks, but he'd do them twice, always. He would go over it the second time you know, and check the plane. And uh, so anyway, we got in the plane, we took off. Uh, we're flying back and Fred was sort of like, I, I think there's, you know, a noise that he was worried about with the plane. And because of that guy saying that, maybe it was just on his mind, you know, maybe there's something wrong with it. But anyway, he decided that, oh, I think we'll land at Sydney and just check the plane. You know, I, I just want to make sure that it's all right to get back to Melbourne. So uh, he headed, he started to head across to Sydney and he actually flew over Richmond. Might Was have it been Rich? fringed control infringed. Space at, at, near Richmond, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 In, infringed um, Richmond, control. Richmond control. And uh, next minute, there's this giant big black helicopter right next to our little Cessna. And they're talking to Fred, and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, it's, it's no markings, it's this black, black helicopter right next to us. And they told him to land. And so we landed, at, I think at Richmond, and um, he, he was called to the office. And, um, but that's the only mistake that I know that he did, you know, that I know of. And, um, I mean, there's nothing up there to tell you that you're cutting across, you know, and it was just the corner that he cut across. So there's nothing up there. It's not like traffic lights or, you know, things like that to tell you that, you know. I mean, they've got maps and things, but, you know, um, I don't think he looked at the map. He was just, you know, we'll, we'll head over that way. 
and he got in trouble for that. And I had to stay in, I was, someone came up to me and said, you've got to just sit and stay in this aeroplane. Don't get out, don't go anywhere, don't talk to anyone. And then, yeah, and then Fred came back and he was a bit quiet, you know, and he said, oh, I've been told off. And he said, I'll have to see, go and see someone when I get back about it, you know. So, but he just got reprimanded and said, you know, just be careful when you're flying and what you're doing. And uh, so that was okay. So we came back from there. There's been certain things said about him believing in UFOs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, as you would know, there's stuff out there about him being fanatical about UFOs and having a scrapbook about UFOs. I'm sure you would have heard it. And, well, I never saw the scrapbook, ever. And I think if he had one, he would have shown me. Um, but he did have an interest, just like probably all of us had an interest, you know, maybe some little interest in it. Curiosity. Curiosity. I mean, Close Encounters of the Third Kind had just come out that year, I think, or maybe 77. Yeah. And um, we loved that movie, you know. We thought it was great. And... Um, Chariots of the Gods. Chariots of the Gods. Fred read that book. So, you know, you we, it, everyone had a bit of an interest. And, but he wasn't fanatical about it, like a lot of the things say that he was. And he had a big scrapbook on all, you know, you know UFO sightings and everything like that. Well, he didn't, and if he did, it wasn't a big, you know, thing. So, but him and his mum did see a UFO one night. His mum saw it, and she saw it first and called him out, and he saw it. And it was just like you and I would maybe see a UFO. It was a very bright light in the sky. They knew it wasn't a planet, um, and they saw it moving, and then it just stayed still. And then they're watching it, and then it just took off, and it just took off so fast. And that's when both of them said, well, maybe that was a UFO that we saw, you know? I mean, they don't know, but they assume that it might have been one. So that was the, when they talk about that, that was that event where it was just his mum and him. The only time he spoke with you was Mount Dandenong. Yes. Uh, Quite often we would go to Mount Dandenong Ranges, um, park up there, and nothing happened <laughs> most of the time. But <laughs> we would uh, talk. We talked a lot, and it was amazing how much we talked. And um, he was talking to me that night about the movie Close Encounters because he took Ricky, his son, his son, his brother, to that movie and um, he loved the movie so he was telling me all about it because I wanted to see it too. So um, when we were sitting up there that night he said to me um, if a UFO landed he said I would love to go with the UFO or into the UFO you know I mean he had an interest but I would be the same I would love to you know have a look in it see it or whatever so anyway he did say that to me and then he turned around and he said but never without you he wouldn't go without me so ended up also that came out of that is this guy in america called micah hanks now i don't know if anyone knows micah hanks anyone no no well he's a podcaster presenter knows a lot about ufos He's in a band, um, spoken to him, and he also wrote a song about that and called it Never Without You. So it is on YouTube if you want to look it up, but he wrote a song about, after hearing that story, he wrote a song about that. So, uh, so you'd been going together about six months. Yeah. And uh, then on October, Friday, October the 13th. Oh, well, yeah, I'll just... Oh, sure. um, Okay, I've got a little list here. Yeah. Um, it was Friday, April the 21st in 1978 that I met Fred, and that was in that corridor. Uh, 
Saturday to April the 22nd was the dinner dance that we went to. And Saturday, the May the 20th, Fred asked me to be his girlfriend. Right. We'd gone out many times before that, but he asked, asked me to be his girlfriend. On Friday, June the 9th, was Fred's 20th birthday. Now, June the 9th is also his mother's birthday and his two twin sisters. They're all on the same day, June the 9th. Uh, Sunday the 20th of August, uh, now Fred was going away for two weeks with, down to sail uh, with the Air Force. It was part of, you know, two weeks of like a bivouac thing where they had to go, had training. And um, I remember my, my brother's birthday was the 22nd of August and it was going to be his 21st birthday. And Fred was saying, well, I can't make it. I've got to go to sail. I can't go to the brother's 21st, which is a big thing in those days, 21st birthdays, a big party in the backyard. And so on the Sunday, which is the 20th of August, which is actually our anniversary, because it was the Saturday, the 20th of May, that he asked me to be his girlfriend. So that was our like anniversary of when we were official. So on Sunday, the 20th of August, 1978, he took me to a restaurant in Moorabbin and it was called the Troika restaurant. It was a uh, like Russian restaurant. And, um, and, and Fred was also one of those would celebrate every like month anniversary. <laughs> you know, usually you celebrate every year, <laughs> um, but no, he had to celebrate every month. Um, so we went to this Troika restaurant and uh, we were about three months together then. And I walked in and um, beautiful, re one of those fancy sort of where they put the napkin on your lap and, you know, don't forget I'm only 16. So, you know, <laughs> this is all, wow, this is so good. And, um, you know, so we chose our meals and uh, he went out to the car, came back in and he had this, um, he had two like stuffed monkeys and they were like hugging each other uh as like a velcro you know where they you know and a big bunch of roses in the middle of it and this is three months you know so it just shows you you know how he felt about me and me for him but he he um also organized that night to have a violin come and play at our table and that restaurant didn't have a violin player, so he had organised that as well to come and, you know, play at the table. What a romantic. Yes, very, yeah, very romantic. And like I said, he opened the car door all the time. He opened any door for me, you know, as a real gentleman. And um, so he gave me that for our three months together. And um, so Saturday, August the... 26th, he went to sail for two weeks. He wrote me a love letter every day. So I've got two weeks worth of love letters at home from him. Uh, and then Saturday, uh, September the 30th, 1978, we went to the Melbourne show with Ricky, his brother. So it was only 12. So we took him out for the day to the Melbourne show and he just loved it. And we spoiled him rotten. Uh, Friday, the, October the 13th, 1978, so we're into October. Fred and I went up to Mount Dandenong again and we're having our chat or whatever. Fred asked me to marry him that night, yeah. Uh, he gave me a ring. Uh, it was a friendship ring, which I have with me. And he did ask me to marry him, but he said to me that night, he goes, I'm going to give you this ring now, which is this ring here. It actually doesn't fit on my ring finger anymore. <laughs> so I have to be really careful. I don't want to lose it. I've had it all these years. And he gave me this ring. And he said, your ring is on lay-by at a jewels in Mooney Ponds. Now, he worked at the army disposal store in Mooney Ponds. And his mo mother worked nearby there. And he told me what jewels it it was that. And he said to me, uh, 
He said, I don't want you to tell your parents yet. And he said, because I would like it to be a surprise at Christmas. He said, by then I would have the ring paid off and I can ask you again, you know, in front of the family. And so I thought, oh yeah, they, you know, how nice is that? And um, so I had this ring and um, he, what he was doing was giving mum, his mum the money and she would make the payments on the ring at the jewellers uh, because he couldn't always get there. Uh, so she would go and, you know, and she probably paid some of the money as well. So, um, so another thing I'll, I might as well say now, after he went missing, I went to try with my father to try and get that ring. And my father, I said, well, I'll pay for whatever's owing on that ring. And, um, we went to the jewellers because I know which one it was because he told me and we went into the jewellers and the jewellers would not let me even see the ring or even let me buy the ring. Uh, he said, you don't have a receipt. And my face was everywhere. So he knew who I was and he knew the story and the name, Valentich. So it was like, okay, you're going to keep the ring, you know, like... So, but he wouldn't even let me have a look at it. I would just even have a look at it, you know, see what he picked out for me. But um, he wouldn't, and he wouldn't let us pay it off. So I ended up, I found out years later that um, Alberta ended up paying it off, and she had it. Uh, I never got to see it, even with her, she didn't show me. So, yeah, it was really interesting. Um, but, uh, so... Yeah, he asked, and then he said, you know, we're going to make the announcement at Christmas time. So and That's when you'd be, after you're 17. Yeah, yeah. He, he said to me that, um, he had everything planned out. He said to me, you're 16 now, you'll be 17 in December, 10th of December. And then he said, so then we'll have, because um, I had very old fashioned parents. So he said, we'll have a year engagement. So you'll be 18 and then we can get married, you know, without the worry of, we don't have to, we're 18, we can get married, you know. And he always wanted like four kids, you know, he used to always, he loved kids, he loved his twin sisters. And um, yeah, so he, he wanted it, that's the way he had everything planned out already, you know, so. Um, so the day of the flight. His flight. Yeah, when you were going to go on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, on, yep. well, on Friday, the, October the 20th, was our anniversary. Now, um, that's the night before he went missing. So he went missing on 21st of October. So he came over to my place that night, gave me a hairdresser, a uh, ha hairdryer, I mean. Um, another thing, you know, it's like every month he would give me something for our anniversary. So um, we had a good chat that night. We, we talked about the next day because I was going on that flight with him. I was, we planned it all, you know. Um, so come to Saturday, October the 21st, 1978, Fred got up, had his breakfast, went to work at Mooney Ponds um, at, the, at the Army Disposal Store. And then he, he went, when he finished work at midday, because Back then in 78, everything shut at 12 o'clock on a Saturday. And so he went off to um, Moorabbin Airport and parked in the car park. He would have been a bit early for his class, but he would have looked at his, you know, notes and everything, getting himself prepared for his exams and for commercial, co commercial pilot's, license. pilot's license. So... Anyway, with me, I got up, got ready, went to work. And I was working in at that chemist, Night Owl Pharmacy. And um, I was supposed to knock off at two o'clock that day. And it's such a strange day because the girl that was supposed to come in and, well, chemists stayed open longer than 12 on a Saturday because they were chemists, right? Um, so she was supposed to come in at two o'clock and take over from me. And my parents had agreed 
to come and pick me up because they were going to my uncle's house, which is East Bentley. So I know you probably don't know a lot of these places, but East Bentley is near Moravan, right? So they could drop me off at Moravan Airport. And there was no problems with that at that time. So, uh, and Fred, he, his instructor for that day was an hour late. So it's very strange because, you know, we were supposed to probably leave to go to King Island at about three because we had so many plans for that night. And we would have been back by, say, 4.30 um, that, that afternoon. So the thing is, Fred was late with his class, right? So that set him back an hour. I was, that girl that was supposed to come, she was an hour late. So I was set back an hour. Now, by then, my parents said, well, we can't wait an hour so we can't take you now. So I went home from work and I thought, well, how am I gonna to get to Moorabbin? Um, I asked my brother and my brother said, no way, you know, because younger sister's not going to go in the car with my mates, you know, so uh, wasn't gonna get a lift with my brother. And so I rang the taxi company and said, um, how much would it be for a taxi fare from Preston to Moorabbin Airport, and they told me $20. Uh, believe me, back then, in 78, $20 was a lot of money, and I only got paid $80, so I already paid the rent, and I paid, uh, you know, other things, so I think I only had $20 left, and I thought, well, I can't really afford the taxi. You know, I'm gonna see Fred tonight. You know, it's, it's no real big deal that I go or not. But the thing is, we had no mobiles. So I didn't know where his classes were. So I couldn't ring him and tell him that I'm not coming. So it's, it's just a weird day that all these things happened and he was held up. So he, will, he left later than what he was going to leave. And I didn't make it because of work and I couldn't get a lift. And then, um, he went, he w would have gone to class, so he's late, so he's left late. And I know, I don't know for a fact, but I know that he wouldn't have had lunch. He would have gone straight from work to Moorabbin. And, um, and then he, after classes, he would have waited for me because as I said, no phones, I couldn't ring him. So he's thinking, oh, she's running late. So he would have waited. So he's getting later and later. And, and the reason for the flight? Ah, uh, yeah. The reason for the flight was really to just get more hours up for his next exam. Now, everything you hear about everything, it's, it's rubbish. You know, like the crayfish thing, okay? Now, Ronald, we were going to Ronald's house that night. We were going to, we were going to Fred's family's first because they had a relative coming over that had come visit from Italy and they said, you've got to, to Fred, they said, you've got to call in. No matter what your plans are, you've got to call in, see these relatives, you know, if you don't, you're in trouble, you know. So uh, we, we were going to his house first um, and then after that we were going to Ronald Grandy's um, house. Now, you know, he was a squadron leader. He had lots of money. He had a nice house. He used to put on these massive parties. And he would have everything. He would have the best of, you know. And he would have, like, well, crayfish, right? And, and all different things. Nice, good wines. So he asked Fred, and it was the week before, and I was with Fred. And he asked Fred, he said... I know you're going to King Island. I know you can get crayfish during the daytime. Now, he got held up, right? So he knew I can't get those crayfish, right? Because it's later, the fishermen have gone home, right? So all these things you hear about the crayfish, Ronald gave him $200, which is way over, you know, $100 probably would have been enough, 
you know, back then. And he gave him $200 just in case. And he goes, if you can get crayfish, if you can get crayfish, get them and bring them to the party because it's going to make the party a lot better, you know, if you've got these, you know, beautiful crayfish. And people have asked me, what about eskies? Well, I know the fishermen, I mean, Fred had brought crayfish back before with his father. He'd been to King Island three times before with Guido. And they brought back crayfish. And you don't have to always order the crayfish. If you go early enough, you can get crayfish without ordering them because there's a lot of controversy about that he didn't order the crayfish. Well, you don't have to always order the crayfish. You can get them. In, the, in that video, it said he was on a cargo flight, which is rubbish. No, he was yeah. Getting hours he up. was getting hours up. And that's all he was doing, you know. And um, the fishermen supply those foam eskies. You know, those old foam eskies. Oh, I might move it on to the flight now, unless there's anything else you've got noted there. No, Before but... we have the break. Yeah. I'm, I'll just have to pinch me that. But so, I'll just say that sure. he, um, because he was late and getting later, and you'll see a photo. I took a photo at that yeah, time okay. down there, Cape okay, Hotway, and you'll see the, you know, the light and everything. But it wasn't quite dark, but... I think because it was getting later that he's gone, um, I'm just going to do a flyover of King Island sure. and come back. Don't forget, it was just getting hours up. There was no guaranteed great pitch. There was no guarantee with the lights being turned on at King Island. You know, they say with him not turning the lights on. Sure. Okay, so there it is leading up to the flight and it's a very easy flight from on a perfect day, near perfect, straight across the bay to the heads, keep the land on the right, water on the left, down to Cape Otway, and then to, uh, in a single engine aeroplane, you're not allowed to fly more than 50 miles over water between successive land masses. If you're coming down from Wilson's Promontory, you go Deal Island, Seal Island, Hogan Island, Flinders Island, Cape Barron Island, and around there, and nothing's over 50 miles. From Cape Otway to the airport there is 64, but to the top of the island it's 50, so he could certainly do that in a single engine aeroplane. And uh, so off he goes, doesn't know where Rhonda is, but he's going to go and do the flight anyway. Departs, uh, I think it was um, 19 minutes past six from Rabin, gets over Cape Otway Lighthouse right on seven o'clock. Uh, it's not last light until 18 minutes past seven. And uh, he's got, by this stage, he's got what's called a class four night VMC rating. He can fly clear of cloud uh, of a night time. He's trained on instruments and he's trained to take off and land in the dark. Usually you've got to organise back in those days to put the lights on. But he didn't. He had five hours of fuel. He could fly over there, over the beacon, turn around, and come back again. That's no problems. So he gets here six at uh, seven o'clock. Six minutes later, um, it starts to get very strange. That's his flight plan. There, interesting things on his flight plan. It's an night VMC flight, uh, and he's one eighty two. It's uh, got his time intervals, 41 minutes down to Cape Otway, 28 minutes down to the island. He's got five hours of fuel when he takes off out of Moorabbin, plenty of fuel. So he's only used about an hour of it. He's got uh, life jackets, one life jacket. Well, that's all he had to put on the flight plan because there's only one person on the flight. Could have had others in the back of the aeroplane. It would have made sense to carry four jackets on the aircraft because if he met anyone at the island that wanted to come back to Moorabbin, he'd have to have a life jacket for them. Okay. So this is the accident report and it's quite interesting, the whole sequence of reporting. So he's... Um, he comes over the lighthouse and six minutes later um, from Delta Sierra Juliet, uh, Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet, is there any known traffic below 5,000? 
And flight service, a lot of the things the, the tower said, it's not in a tower, it's in a room like this. A tower is at the airport watching the runways, flight service units just in a, in a building. Steve Roby says, Dallas Sierra Juliet, no known traffic. Then he says, Dallas Sierra Juliet, uh, I am, seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000. Dallas Sierra Juliet, what type of aircraft is it? Dallas Sierra Juliet, I cannot affirm. It is for bright, it seems to me, like landing lights. At uh, seven minutes past six, Dallas Sierra Juliet, uh, Keith Ro uh, C. Roby replies. Then he, Fred says, Dallas Sierra Juliet, uh, Melbourne's Dallas Sierra Juliet, the aircraft has just passed over me at at least a thousand feet above. Dallas Sierra Juliet, Roger. And it is a large aircraft, confirm. Uh, er, unknown due to the speed it's travelling. Is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? Uh, Dallas Air Juliet, no known aircraft in the vicinity. Melbourne, it's approaching now from due east toward me. So he's heading south, it's coming this way towards him. Dallas Air Juliet uh, is just an acknowledgement. And then open microphone for two seconds. He's pressed the button for some reason. Then Fred says, Dallas Air Juliet, it seems to me that he's playing some sort of game. He's flying over me at two, three times at, at a time at speeds I could not identify. Dallas Air Juliet, Roger, what is your actual level? Dallas Air Juliet, my level is four and a half thousand feet. Because he's a little bit rattled at that stage because that's not the correct terminology, it's 4500, zero, zero, which he corrects himself there. Um, Dallas Air Juliet, and confirm you cannot identify the aircraft. Uh, Dallas Air Juliet, affirmative. Dallas Air Juliet, Roger, stand by, Steve Roby says. Dallas Air Juliet, uh, Melbourne, Dallas Air Juliet, it's not an aircraft, it is open microphone for two seconds. Dallas Air Juliet, can you describe the uh, aircraft? Dallas Air Juliet's flying past. It's a long shape. Open microphone for three seconds. Cannot identify more than that. It has such speed. Open microphone for three seconds. Before me right now, Melbourne. Dallas Air Juliet, Roger, how large? would the er uh, object be? Dallas Air Juliet, Melbourne, it seems like it's stationary. And I'm, what I'm doing right now is orbiting. So he's gone into a turn. And the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and some sort of metallic light. It's all shiny on the outside. Dallas Air Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet open microphone for five seconds. It's just vanished. And Steve Roby acknowledges, Melbourne, would you know what kind of aircraft I've got? Is it a military aircraft? Delta Sierra Juliet confirmed the aircraft just vanished. Delta Sierra Juliet, say again. Delta Sierra Juliet, is the aircraft still with you? Delta Sierra Juliet, it's a uh, not nor open microphone two seconds now approaching from the southwest so it did he's heading south it's come in from the east and now it's coming this way del sierra juliet the engine is rough idling i've got it set at 23 24 that's 23 inches of manifold pressure 2400 revs and the thing is coughing Delta Sierra Juliet, Roger, what are your intentions? Delta Sierra Juliet, my intentions are uh, to go to King Island. Uh, Melbourne, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. Two seconds open microphone. It is hovering. It's not an aircraft. Wow. 
Delacere Juliet. Delacere Juliet, Melbourne. And then there's a 17 second metallic sound. And uh, they, no further communications. And this is six minutes before last light. Uh, there's no record of any further transmissions from the aircraft. He did a good job of not mentioning Van Duur, though, because he, I, Yeah, he was very professional. Comment. Very professional in that. He didn't say UFO. It's an unidentified aircraft, basically another aircraft. But then the last thing he says, it's that aircraft is hovering above me. And no, it's not an aircraft. So telling you... Great photo here of Frederick with uh, DSJ, as I certainly remember when it was pretty new. Now, on that day, there was a fellow, Roy Manifold, a Melbourne plumber on holiday at Crayfish Bay at uh, Cape Otway. And he was out there with a time-lapse uh, camera and he took a series of six photos just on sunset. And uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, here's the little story from old Roy. He's still with us. I believe he's got a bit of dementia. He's in his 80s now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, on that night, I decided I'd go up on the... Uh there it's on the uh, hut and take the, uh, the sun setting in the, in the beautiful end of the west. Oh, I took a series of photographs, about six in, in all, at around about 15, 20 second intervals. And, uh, and that was it. Roy Manifold never saw or heard the mysterious object he caught on film. He could not explain the image he'd captured and nor could Kodak. They come back and they said, oh, it's definitely not a, a developing error. It's nothing to do with the, uh, the film or the development of the film on the print, but they couldn't explain what it was and why it was there. Paul Norman had no doubts what was on the film. He sent the photos to the laboratories of Ground Saucer Watch in America. What they discovered was a solid metallic object about seven metres in diameter about two kilometres out to sea. It was an unknown object uh, rising from the uh, water and it had a lot of mist around it uh, indicating it did come from the water. The Pine Gap Research Facility has never commented publicly on a possible link between their operations and Freddie Valentich's disappearance. But this photograph suggests there is a link. It was taken in the same area at nearly the same time Valentich disappeared. If the eyes and ears of Pine Gap are as powerful as Robert Dean suggests, they must know something about the UFO snapped by amateur photographer Roy Manifold. It was quite a clear night. It was uh, cool. We had the fire going in the, uh, in the front room and uh, everything just seemed normal that night. And I'd, I'd taken the photographs and uh, I'd take, taken the six consecutive ones. And I'd, uh, I'd walked inside and I just uh, came inside Oh, I've only been there about maybe five minutes and I heard an aeroplane uh, pass overhead. The aeroplane was Freddie's Cessna just moments before Valentich's fateful UFO encounter. And later, when Roy had his film developed, along with the beautiful sunset, there was this important clue to Freddie's mysterious disappearance. He got this object here on his sixth frame and... Uh, it was quite strange that he, he thought that at one instant there was something wrong with the camera, but then when he took back to the laboratory at Kyle, they assured him that uh, that object there is nothing wrong with it. He's definitely got an object on it. Computer analysis and enhancement of the UFO in Manifold's photograph reveals that the object was a solid, metallic, reflective sphere, approximately 70 feet in diameter. The fact that this picture was taken just minutes before Manifold heard Valentich's airplane suggests this may be the craft Freddie saw moments before he vanished without a trace. Air Corps officials, however, vehemently disagree. Some of the experts said that he got disorientated and that he was flying upside down. But the Cessna 182 has got uh, the petrol or gas, aviation gas, is in the wings and it's gravity fed to the motor. 
so 49 seconds of flying upside down, the motor would have cut out. He was talking for six and a half minutes. So uh, that tells you he wasn't flying upside down, he wasn't disoriented. Now we're all clear, 229, and there's no strange craft, right? Could be a miscalculation. Did you hear a vibratory? No, I heard nothing but my own sound. Electrical phenomenon, 229. Perhaps ball lightning can do strange things. Mirage is not uncommon with storm flare. Storm flare far off to East Tower. Not paper trail either. Holy, he, here he comes from the southwest. All shiny and metallic. My God, she comes to me. Knowing Frederick, uh, he wouldn't deviate rules and regulation. Uh, I'm quite certain that he would not go on that radio and inquire about to the air traffic controller what he's got around him. Unless it was something really worthwhile to ask. Because to him, it wasn't a conventional aircraft, therefore uh, something else. and could have been extraterrestrial. Uh, but the time will tell. For 17 years, a family has searched for answers, and now they hope that Pine Gap will share its information concerning Freddy, the UFO in this photograph, and one of the most puzzling encounters in UFO history. Well, you heard the transcript, or saw the transcript before you heard the, the tape. That thing that they put on there was bunkum of what was said. It was totally different. I don't know how they make it up. When you can read the transcript, he never said, my God, that's coming after me. I just don't know how they can be so inaccurate. So... Nearly every A lot of them. Very, yeah. So you've got to have a really good filter to filter this stuff out and say, no, inaccurate. So Roy Manifold took six uh, photos. I had three of them. But that was the last one. One apparently showed, number four, something coming out of the water or some disturbance in the water. But when you think if there was water on this thing, you could actually see like a cone. You know, if, if you look, imagine that, I don't know. But whether this is mist or water coming off it. But they certainly said it wasn't a developing error. It was certainly something on that film. And the experts looked at that. We were going to have, at this point, our Scottish interval, <laughs> a wee break, and so we'll move on. Now, the whole thing of disorientation in an aeroplane, it does happen. But on that night, there was a clear horizon. You can see from the photos, a very, and pilots fly visual reference to the horizon. In the aircraft, there's an artificial horizon. So if you're in cloud or of a night time, rather than looking out and working out whether you're turning up, down, whatever, you're looking at the artificial horizon. You're flying by that. But your body f feels sometimes that you're turning when you're not turning. Uh, it's a bit like if you closed your eyes and you sat on an office chair and they spun it, and you say, well, which way is the door? Which way is the window? You wouldn't know because you sort of, you've lost visual reference and you don't know. So then we go on. If you want to see what happens when pilots are disoriented, and there's no way Frederick Valentich was disoriented for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, he was trained to fly at night time. He was trained to fly on instruments uh, and it wasn't dark. And he did aerobatics. Yeah, it did aerobatics, but he was, it wasn't dark. So that's, there's the main one. So, but Friday, July 16th, 1999, Piper Saratoga, a beautiful aeroplane, PA-32, piloted by 38-year-old John uh, Kennedy Jr., crashed into the Atlantic Ocean near Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. All three on board were killed, his wife and his sister-in-law as well. He had a 182, beautiful aeroplane, and that's gravity-fed from the tanks above. The Piper has fuel pumps, um, which pumps it up from uh, the wings. And But the 182, you'd, you'd select both tanks, so it's draining equally from either side. The Piper Saratoga, you'd go an hour from, from one side, an hour to the other side, but there would be a fuel imbalance and it could normally turn. 
he left, his wife and sister-in-law were shopping and they left late and they got into darkness and he's flying to Martha's Vineyard. He selected, so it's really dark. It's like being in a cloud if it's really dark. So he selected, and he was on crutches. He had a crook leg. Most of you shouldn't have been flying. But he selected the automatic terminal weather information and he was one digit out. And he was wondering why he can't get the weather. And so he's mostly looking at that and the thing started to turn by the time he woke up. What's happening? Because he wouldn't have realised he was turning. And uh, by that stage, it was too late and it went in. If you want to see what happens when an aeroplane gets disoriented and goes in, that's his beautiful aircraft. It's got retractable undercarriage, constant speed uh, unit, variable pitch propeller, six-seater, and he traded the 182 in to get that. But that's what they end up with out of the water if you crash it. Just think of what came out of Frederick's aeroplane. Nothing. And that's how it looks. That's what you get with a crash. And yet there was nothing. With a couple of exceptions, there was oil found in the water. Perfect searching conditions. They took samples and it was marine oil. Nothing to do with an aeroplane. As I mentioned, it had a, a cow flaps. There was a cow flap found at Flinders Island five years later, and it's a long way from King Island to uh, Flinders Island for a bit of metal. Metal usually sinks in water, so if it was on the bottom. And they'd proven, yes, it could have come from a 182. It was from a range of models of aircraft, but to travel 190 miles underwater in five years and it could have come from any other aircraft but they couldn't confirm that it was from DSJ. Dispelling the myths. Um, that's Rhonda. Would you like to just mention, this? Rhonda took this photo, was that right on last light or yes. six minutes before? That was uh, at the time he disappeared. That was at the time he disappeared. Yeah. The last radio I call, which was, there. which was. I went down every 10, 10 years. Yeah. Um, down to the Cape. Guido would go every year. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to stay till the time that he went missing to see what the light was like. And I took that photo. And keep in mind, that was six minutes before official last light. So that's a beautiful photo you took, Rhonda. Okay. Disoriented, no, nope, you can scratch that one else. Suicidal, okay. I think people that have looked at him and, and psychological profiles, eight days before he's got uh, engaged. If it was eight days after the divorce, well, you can, you can appreciate it, couldn't you? Did he, did he steal the aircraft? Oh, he stole the aircraft to sell it. Yeah, well, yeah, good luck. He's running drugs, yeah, okay. He was very straight-laced yeah. guy. You could see it in those photos. Hallucinations. Was he hallucinating? Was he, was he um, perpetuating a hoax? Was he shot down by either a fishing boat or military and they tried to cover it up? Was he hijacked? Did he pick up some, someone from Rabin and they hijacked him? You could cross all of those off the list as far as I'm concerned. And you just say, what happens? We've got a radio transmission. Something very strange happened to this guy and this aircraft with no wreckage. So we'll continue on and consider things. There was a story uh, about a UFO being seen the next day, I think it was somewhere towards South Australia, with a Cessna hanging off the side of it. Now, I didn't know whether it was on ropes, chains, Velcro, or magnetically held there with some oil running down, and supposedly a farmer scratched, the, scratched DSJ into his tractor. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, we haven't found out where this happened, a property, a name of a farmer. We know supposedly it was the day after. Um, there's never been a witness that's come forward officially to say that they did see this. And this is nearly 46 years later, we don't have proof of this story. 
So all I can say is that story is out there. I've seen it on video, but it hasn't been proven. And if someone came forward tomorrow and had the tractor with DSJ scratched on it, uh, that would be a different story. So this was a strange one. This is a Fuji aircraft, and you'll see Foxtrot Juliet Juliet. Well, the very one, next one after that was Foxtrot Juliet Kilo, and it was um, a Fuji aircraft, and I was down at Tyab on this day. It was Christmas Eve, 1969. And when if you hear of an aircraft crash on the radio or TV, if you're into aviation, you prick your ears up and say, well, what's happened? Well, the story was that um, a young guy, Peter Phillips, commercial pilot with about nearly 1,500 hours experience, he was an experienced pilot, he had at least 400 hours on type, so he's experienced. He's doing a charter flight from Moorabbin to King Island. He drops these blokes, and I don't know whether he had three spare seats, so it might have been up to three. Drops them off, and he's coming back, same the reciprocal di direction to Frebri, and he reports engine trouble. And this was December the 24th, 1969, and I remember hearing it. I remember listening on Christmas Day to see if there's any further news on him. And the day after that, and they mentioned it on Christmas Day, and nothing else never seen again on the same track. Nothing from the aircraft. And this is, a lot of people don't know about this one, but I certainly remember hearing it. And uh, that was in Foxtrot, Juliet, Kilo. The aeroplane was only a year old, would have had a very good engine in, not many hours on it. What happened to Peter Phillips in Foxtrot, Juliet, Kilo? And that was six, Christmas 69, and of course, it was nine years later that Frederick. Same area. Same area. Same area. Same route. Yeah. yeah. So there it is. The disappearance of uh, Foxer uh, Fuji, Foxer Juliet Kilo, flown by 29-year-old Peter Phillips. And his last call was about eight kilometres south of Cape Otway, at an altitude above uh, 1,000 feet, or about that, experiencing engine trouble. Just very similar to what. Frederick had uh, and reported and disappeared without any trace or wreckage. Now, the other thing with Delta Sierra Juliet, it had a crash beacon on board. And if you have a crash with an aeroplane with a beacon, it'll automatically go off. It didn't go off in DSJ. Yeah. Uh, there's it had one. It's marked on his flight on plan. His flight yep. Plan. Yep. Two months to the day after this happened, big aeroplane, um, Whit Whitworth Argosy freight air aircraft, I think they built about 59 of them, four uh, turboprop engines, big powerful aircraft carrying newspapers between the islands and New Zealand. This is two months to the day, the 21st of December. Now, I'm not too sure whether this is, that's got the video or we'll come on to that. So they're going from Wellington up here down to Christchurch and there's Kaikoura and they call this the Kaikoura Lights and there's Blenheim, uh, our Air Force Base just here. And this was quite a buzz. In December 1978, a series of unexplainable events took place off the east coast of New Zealand's South Island. Still considered some of the best and most credible footage ever captured of an unidentified flying object, the film taken by a national network news team from the cockpit window of an Argosy cargo plane made headlines all around the world. What made the sightings even more bizarre was that they were captured on air traffic control radar too. This is the story of the Kaikoura Lights incident. This week I thought I'd do something a little different. I would say I'm neither a believer in UFO sightings nor a disbeliever. I don't have any opinion on them. All I know is that I haven't seen one myself. However, the story of the Kaikoura Lights as it's known 
I did find him quite interesting, and it's certainly something you hear a lot about growing up in New Zealand. And believe it or not, the story starts where I grew up in Blenheim. So I thought I'd share the story. In the late hours of December 20th, 1978, Warrant Officer Ian Uffendale of the Royal New Zealand Air Force was completing his final security checks before signing off at Woodburn Air Force Base near Blenheim. Catching his eye out east toward the coast was what he initially thought to be landing lights of an aircraft coming in to land. This struck him as odd. At 11.30pm at night, there should have been no aircraft in the area, and if there was, he would have known about it. Uffendale contacted the local air traffic controller. Unaware of aircraft in the vicinity, he was equally bewildered, but suggested to Uffendale it could be the landing lights of an aeroplane approaching Wellington, around 80 miles or 130 kilometres to the north. Although this seemed like a likely explanation, upon contacting the New Zealand Central Air Traffic Control Tower in Wellington, radar operator John Cordy advised them there was no aircraft in the vicinity, but astonishingly, he reported he had unidentified blips showing on his air traffic control radar. They would describe a light that they could see that would be moving north over the hills beyond Lenham, and we would see coincidentally a target on our radar that was also moving north at the same time, and made us think that perhaps these things were related to each other. Meanwhile, at Blenheim, just a few miles east of Woodburn Air Force Base, police were being inundated with calls from locals reporting strange lights in the night sky out east towards the coast. As baffling as the mystery was, it would only get more strange from here on out. At around 2.30am, an Armstrong Whitworth Argosy freighter was en route from Wellington to Christchurch on a routine newspaper delivery run. Captain Vern Powell and First Officer Ian Perry had been informed by air traffic control in Wellington of the unusual lights and the radar anomalies in the vicinity earlier. While the initial stages of the flight were uneventful, at around 3am as the aircraft tracked along the Kaikoura coast, roughly 60 miles southeast of Blenheim, Captain Powell radioed air traffic control in Wellington to report a series of large flashing lights following alongside his aircraft. Popped out of this cloud and here, here was this light, but um, so close that it was almost frightening. You know, what the hang is that? Uh, do we have a, uh, a bright red flashing light uh, out to our uh, north and like the earlier incident a few hours before, the objects appeared on air traffic control radar in Wellington and the aircraft's own onboard radar. The lights followed the aircraft for 40 miles before the plane made its eventual touchdown at Christchurch. It had been an eventful night, but the mystery would only get deeper. However, the next time the lights appeared, a major network news film crew would be on hand to capture it. The incident from the night before had made headlines in all the major newspapers across New Zealand and would quickly make the news in Australia too. In fact, it would pique the interest of one of Australia's largest news networks, then known as Channel Zero, now Network 10, owned by Paramount Global. Australia had had its own UFO story just two months prior, and public interest was at an all-time high. On October the 21st, 1978, 20-year-old pilot Frederick Ballantich disappeared while flying a Cessna 182 over the Bass Strait. While flying out over the ocean, Ballantich radioed air traffic control to report an unidentified aircraft was following him. He claimed four bright lights were flying around him and at some points below or above. A short, panicked conversation with air traffic control ended with Ballantich's final transmission, stating, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It's hovering, and it's not an aircraft. Followed by 17 seconds of open mic, before presumably the Cessna crashed into the ocean. An exhaustive search by authorities failed to ever find Valentich or the Cessna. The Frederick Valentich story is the subject of numerous YouTube videos and continues to intrigue to this day. Interestingly, while his aircraft was never recovered, in 1983 an engine cow flap washed ashore. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau concluded it came from a Cessna 182 between a specific range of serial numbers, including that of the one flying that fateful night.
However, in 1978, the Australian public was gripped by the ordeal. So when the New Zealand incident happened just two months later, Channel Zero sent a team to investigate, but they would get much more than they bargained for. A Channel Zero news team led by renowned Australian television reporter Quentin Fogarty was sent to Wellington to cover the event. Although it would be the same route but different pilots, network bosses in Australia had arranged for Fogarty and his team to go up in the Argosy on a nighttime mail run to film the location where the sightings had happened. Thought the job would be interesting. It was a good story. We were following up a strong UFO sighting. I had an interest in that. Um, but I didn't for one second even begin to imagine that we would get involved in something as well. Around half an hour into the flight, as the plane tracked along the Kaikoura coast towards Christchurch, Fogarty and his crew heard an urgent call to get up onto the flight deck. The very first thing we saw was these sort of balls of light that would just appear in the sky. And I mean, it was really just looking through small windows at a very, very black sky and seeing pulsating lights. Um, that started usually as a very, very small pinprick of light and then would go into a, like a, a great globe of light. And just like the week before, whatever it was, was showing on air traffic control radar. The people in the aeroplane were seeing lights in the sky where the radar was reporting. There, there was the same correlation between radar target and uh, nocturnal light. The lights followed the aircraft for around 15 minutes. The plane landed safely in Christchurch before taking off again for the return journey. The following day, the news media went into a frenzy. The event and subsequent footage taken on board that night made world headlines not only in New Zealand, but right across the world. Interest had been piqued by the fact that not only had the objects appeared on air traffic control radar, but a credible and reliable source had shot the footage. Even to this day, many consider the footage and the events of that night to be one of the best and hardest to explain unidentified flying object sightings ever. The Royal New Zealand Air Force and the New Zealand Police were tasked with investigating the event. The New Zealand Ministry of Defence returned with a public report that attributed the event to lights from a squid boat reflecting off the clouds, or another natural but unusual phenomenon like Venus, atmospheric conditions, a meteor, or even lights from cars or trains. Royal New Zealand Air Force Warrant Officer Ian Uffendale, who had first witnessed the lights over Woodburn military base on December 20th, had this to say, It is my opinion that this inquiry was a farce from the beginning. Whilst the committee was comprised of men with high degrees of intelligence and scientific background, I believe they were all biased towards the type of findings they arrived at before they even commenced the inquiry. I know what the sky is all about. I know an aeroplane when I see it. I know... Uh a meteor when I see it, or I know a star or a planet when I see it, and what we saw that night was none of those things. As for showing on air traffic control radar, the report simply put it down to faults with the radar itself, or bizarrely, moonlight reflecting off a cabbage field. It certainly wasn't a, a squid boat. I never see one at 13,000 feet up in the air anyway. The Venus hadn't risen, so I don't know what it was. The air crew could have seen the light reflected on cabbages, but I've never known cabbages reflect on a radar screen before. And certainly, I'd like to know who was growing cabbages 20 miles out of the southeast of Wellington, well over the sea. I know what uh, Venus looks like, I know what planets look like and stars look like, and it was definitely none of those things. Declassified military documents from 1978, released under the Official Information Act in 2010, stated that the sightings were unique because of a large amount of documented evidence, which included countless eyewitnesses, two tape recordings, and the detection of unusual ground and aircraft radar targets. Whether its origins are a rational earthly explanation or something more difficult to explain, the Kaikoura Lights incident remains one of the most intriguing and unexplainable unidentified flying object encounters ever. Let me know in the comments section what you think it could have been. And for any New Zealanders watching, have you got your own story from that night? And as always, thanks for watching. Okay, Quentin Fogarty subsequently wrote a book because when the... Uh, 
UFOs appeared on the next leg. Well, one of the crew, he took a cameraman, uh, David Crockett, with him on this flight, and the sound recorder was Crockett's wife, Magia. And she was so frightened, she got off at the next port and wouldn't get back on the flight. But then they took the next flight. And uh, when these objects came again and were reported on radar, Quentin Fogarty said to the captain, let's hope they're friendly, which I think would be a natural reaction. He wrote a book, Let's Hope They're Friendly. And that movement there was taken in one film. One little frame. Yeah, incredible. And then you've got these ones as well. What the heck are we dealing with two months after the disappearance of Frederick? Or two months and nine days in this case, because it was the second sighting in New Zealand. But quite incredible photos and no one can give. There's sort of a government cover-up over there. You know, they, Even the blokes in the Air Force Base said, no, we know what we saw. And the one thing with pilots, trained professional pilots know what's normal and what's not normal and uh, you're pretty hard to convince them of otherwise so there's some others but on the day of uh, Frederick's disappearance Rhonda was going to comment on sightings that were there and I'll hand the microphone back to Rhonda Thank you. Mm. I'll talk about the sightings uh, 1978 sightings, UFO sightings. Um, Paul Norman, he ran the Melbourne UFO group, uh, which you saw Paul on there, um, where people could re report their UFO sightings. He said he had 300 UFO reports leading up to the 21st of October. He said it peaked on the 21st and the phones rang off the hook. He sifted through, three, the, through the 300 reports and narrowed it down to 50 that were good reports. The RAAF had 11 UFO reports on the 21st of October. King Island has had six weeks of UFO reports leading up to the 21st of October. Other reports on the day, 21st of October, were, now I'm just gonna say the places that people reported UFOs on the 21st of October. They were at Werribee, Gippsland, Geelong, Frankston, Brighton, Queenscliff, Seaford, Tasmania, South Australia, New Zealand, King Island and Cape Otway. Also a group of nine people playing tennis in Gertrude Street in Fitzroy. Were all reported on that day that Fred went missing. Uh, Quinton Fogarty, which we've just seen, that was two months later. And the first UFO sighting in Bass Strait was in 1896, witnessed by hundreds of people, and they said it was a cigar shape with a green light, and was exactly what Fred said. Okay. Um, with Fred's search... Um, there were four twin-engine light planes, a long-range maritime nomad RAAF Orion search, and they searched 200,000 hectare area in a grid search. So they really covered, you know, the area. And I think because Fred was to do with the Air Force, he got a bit more help with having the Orion and, you know, uh, extra search as well. Uh, the planes covered a big triangular area from Cape Shank uh, to a point 50 k's east of King Island and across to Cape Otway. A Cessna 150 police and volunteers searched all of King Island. The search finished on the 25th of October 1978 and nothing was ever found in all that. My search, well, I tried to go to King Island, uh, not King Island, sorry, Cape Otway, um, Apollo Bay, to, you know, help if I could with the search. Um, I went down there and uh, I was driven out of Apollo Bay by media. Now, 
I'll, I'll say about the media, but I was driven out of there by media. Um, I should talk about that first. Um, well, sort of harassed. Yeah, I went down to Cape Hot Way and um, I, uh, a close friend of Fred's who was in the Air Force, uh, John Gibbs, he was coming down too with his family's wife and his first child who was still very young. And uh, we arranged to go down there and maybe help with the search. Um, he went, uh, we went, at, you know, like head, just headed down there. We, we hadn't booked anything. I said to John, look, you know, if I get there first, I'll just check if you're booked into a motel and you can check if I'm booked in or whatever. So we got there first and I went to the first motel that you come to when you drive into Hollow Bay. And um, mum said, oh, I don't like the look of this, you know. So, um, obviously, we weren't going to stay there. But anyway, I went in and I asked for John Gibbs. I said, is a John Gibbs booked in? That's what I wanted to know, if he'd already booked in. She said to me, no, there's no one by that name. And I said, all right, thank you. We may come back and stay here. We might, I don't know. Um, so she said, are you here for the search? You know, I said, yeah, we've come down for the search or help if we can. My face was plastered everywhere. So people would have known who I was, you know. Um, even when I came here today, people go, oh, <laughs> I know who you are, you know. And I'm like, how old am I now? You know, but anyway, um, so we moved on. Oh, we, Dad did a U-turn and as we did that, I said to Dad, look, there's John, John's car has just driven past the end of the street. So we caught up to John, we two caught up to him. And uh, um, John, we talked and said, let's just go to another motel, which we did. We went to another motel and booked in there and um, had dinner or went to bed. Knock, knock, six o'clock in the morning, knock on our door. And the motel owner said, uh, you're here for the search? Yes, we are. And they, he said, I have a lobby full of reporters. No one knew I was going down there, all right? I have a lobby full of reporters. Do you want to talk to them? I go, no, that's why I'm here, to get away from that. And um, so he said, okay. Uh, he said, I'll, um, I'll bring you up some breakfast and then I'll show you out the back door and you can go or, you know. So I, I never got to have a search at all. John stayed and he tried to search. Um, John and some of the Air Force guys, they wanted to go into the bush because no one had looked in the bush. You want to just try anything, you know, it's a mate. You know, they wanted to just search anywhere. But the police stopped them from going into the bush would not let them go in and search because it was so thick. The bush down there is just rugged, thick bush. And they said, if you go in, we're not coming in to rescue you. So don't go in there. So they ended up not going in to search the bush. And uh, over the years, I've had friends who are pilots and they fly over that a lot. And they said, you cannot see anything. You can't see if there's anything down there. So anyway, um, we left, we left out the back door and Dad always wanted to get the newspaper. <laughs> Let's see what's in it today, all right? Um, so Dad ran in, bought the Australian, it was the Australian newspaper, and the headline is what we showed you before, that I went there for a secret rendezvous with Fred. And that was the headline of that day. And that came from that first motel I went to. She knew who I was, and, uh, and they interviewed her, apparently, and that's a story that she gave, that I'd, I'd asked for Fred, and then I was having a secret rendezvous. You know, so it's, it's crazy. Um, the media, which I've got written here some, they did, what did I put, um, they had, they did, Oh, where have I got it written? Uh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. They were, they, they made it worse, I was going to say, that, you know, out of the whole thing. Uh, from the moment, oh, from the moment it happened, like, that night, the Saturday night when he went missing, I had bought a new outfit to go out, you know, and it cost me nearly my whole wage. <laughs> and um, I was ready for Fred to turn up, and he didn't, so, which is... So unusual because Fred was one of those people that if he was five minutes late, he would stop at a phone booth because we didn't have phones, right? And ring me to tell me he's going to be five minutes late, you know, so he's wasted five minutes doing that. But you know what I mean? He was, he was like that. So I'm thinking something's happened. You know, he would have rung me. He would have rung me. So anyway, um, that night I stayed in those clothes and lied on top of my bed. So I was like thinking something has gone wrong. We had a big night planned. And um, so anyway, the next morning, my dad rigid, uh, religiously, religiously would listen to the ABC at 6 a.m. Always, you know, he would listen. And the ABC News came on, and the first thing they said was a pilot had gone missing over Bass Strait. Next thing I hear is my dad saying, I was in the next room, it was only a two bedroom house. My dad saying to me, Rhonda, he knew I was awake. Did you hear that? And I go, Yes, Dad. And he said, Do you think we should ring Moorabbin? I go, Yes, Dad. So I got on the phone. I rang Moorabbin, I was the first person to ring and I said I think I know the pilot that's gone missing over Bass Strait and they said to me, who do you think it is? And I said I think it's Frederick Valentich <coughs> and then when they said hold the line, because they wouldn't say that if it wasn't Fred and I just, <laughs> I was a mess, so I gave the phone to Dad and Dad talked to them. And then um, about an hour later, the police were at our door, you know, asking us questions. And then the police had to ask me where Fred lived. So I gave the police Fred's address and then they went and told his parents. So, um, and then uh, that was Sunday, Sunday lunchtime, the phone started ringing and would not stop ringing constantly. The media was unbelievable. Uh, Mum ended up, she took the phone off the hook back in those days. You'd get a whistle through your phone if it was off the hook to tell you your phone's off the hook. So she could hear this whistle noise. So she said, oh, I can't have that. So she ripped the phone out of the wall so that it would not ring anymore. It, it just constantly rang. And then we had people out the front, media out the front of our house, constantly, and from everything, everything you could think of at the time, they were out the front of the house. So that day, I gave an interview to one of the media things for the, for the news that night, to, you know, the news for that night. And then it just did not stop. I had people sitting out the front of my house in a car waiting for, like, I don't know, any movement or whatever. And, and what they would do, another car would come up behind that car. He would toot. He would drive off and he'd sit there for 12 hours. <laughs> and, and that's the way it was. And they just wrote, and that went for a week, easy, you know. And media just constantly... Well, we didn't put the phone back in for a while, but just constantly coming around, you know. So I was not, ha you know, handling things very well. So I said to mum, or well, mum and dad said, you know, look, we'll take you out to um, John's house, John Gibbs, who I mentioned before was Fred's close friend in the Air Force. We'll take you out there. You can stay with him, get away from the media, have a break from it, okay. So I went out there, um, still a mess. So John took me to the doctor. The doctor gave me some antidepressants. And then um, 
on the Wednesday, uh, Greg Rayburn, who was a, in the Air Force uh, cadet, or not, trainer of the cadets, um, an ATC, Air, Tra Air Training Cadet Training Corps. Corps, and um, he came out to Nuremberg, which is nearly to the Dandenongs, where John lived, in, you know, and he came out there to pick me up to take me into the Department of Transport. They wanted to interview us. They interviewed everyone, really, that was involved in it. And when you look back on it, I probably should have had my parents with me. I was only 16. They shone lo um, shined lights into my face, uh, like a real, you know, investigation kind of thing. Um, yeah. They had lights facing towards me and it was horrible and it was horrible the things they asked me and they asked me some very 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 personal questions about Fred and I and yeah I told them the truth but when the report came out there was a lot of stuff in that that they assumed or made up from talking to me you know their point of view of me you know, so that that was horrible. And then on the that was the Wednesday. On the it was on the Thursday that we went to Cape Otway. So um, that's when that story I told you just before that the media pretty much chased us out of Apollo Bay, so we couldn't do any search. And the team that was in the foyer of that motel was. The Willisie team. But it wasn't Mike, it was Terry. Terry did it before Mike did. And it was Terry, Willisie and the team there in the motel. And apparently that owner of that motel told them that I had left an hour later. So they got in the car, chased after me, but they didn't catch up to us. So, which is good. <laughs> and I didn't hear from him again, so, which was even better. But, um, yeah, the media coverage, coverage, uh, coverage caused more headache than the loss alone. You know, it was horrible. Um, and, and like I was saying to someone today, that they have not left me alone in 46 years. I get contacted every year by someone, mm -hmm. um, somewhere around the world that wants to talk to me about this story. I don't talk to everyone that I have given the story and always given it truthfully. And yet a lot of documentaries out there have changed exactly what I've said. And I think, well, why did you waste my time and interview me if you're going to just put whatever story you want to put out there? So don't believe everything that you hear in some of those, you know, because there's a documentary out there, The Unexplained Files, I think. And they've got me coming out of that motel, crying my eyes out that, you know, Fred wasn't there to meet me. I told them the story and that's what they put, you know, probably because of that headline. So. So what was the effect on you, Rhonda? How did it affect you? Uh, Only 16. Yeah, it was, well, it was hard. I lost my job over it. And you loved the job. I loved that job, yeah. Working in the chemist. I lost that job. I didn't get another job for about a year, so I stayed home for about a year and a bit. Um, hard to do a lot of things. Um, this was just recognisable in a way. Um, I've written here a few notes. Uh, my, I had two lowest points. Uh, one of them was the first year anniversary and I still, I still felt that pain, and he's really gone, and I'll never see him again. I have to spend the rest of my life without him. My future was taken away from me, and any children I would have had was taken away. The children with him it was taken away. Um, my other lowest point is my overdose. I took an overdose, and I still, I tell everyone, that, you know. Um, when I went and stayed with John, he took me to that doctor. 
The doctor gave me antidepressants because I was a, I was a real mess. And back then, when you get antidepressants back then, they were in a bottle for 100 with a little, you know, bit of cotton wool in the top, you know, so not like now. And um, so it was, I think it was about 25 days after Fred went missing. Um, I was still struggling with the whole thing. And I had very old fashioned parents. I was, they, they adopted me when they were 40. So, you know, and they were sort of old fashioned parents. So I don't think they knew how to handle the situation or what to do or how to talk to me. I needed someone to talk to. I needed someone to listen to me or something or to help me, you know. So um, I wanted that night, uh, this is about 25 days after, um, I wanted that night to go to my girlfriend's house because I knew she would talk to me, she would listen to me. I just needed to, I was having a bad night. So my parents wouldn't let me go. So I didn't know what to do. They didn't want to talk about it. So I went and took 75 tablets. So it's 100 in the bottle, 25 days later, and I took the rest of them, which was 75. Because when they pumped my stomach, they told me there were 75 tablets in there. Now I could have gone to my room, it would have been the end of me, but no, I went and sat with mum and dad in the lounge. Because I don't think I really wanted to do that. But I wanted someone to help me. You listen to me? Talk to someone. And um, so I sat with them and I must have just passed out. And they took me to the hospital, pumped my stomach. And um, do you know what? I was in that hospital for a week. No one came to see me. No one talked to me. No priest came. No psychiatrist came, but I suppose in those days, I don't know how they looked at it, you know, but no one still helped me. Not even a chaplain? Not even a chaplain, no one. No one talked to me, doctors didn't talk to me, nurses didn't talk to me, parents didn't even come and visit me. Came one day to visit me. So, incredible. I had to then realise that this, this is going to stick with me the rest of life, but I've got to just keep going you know, and deal with it. And in the end, I had friends that sort of helped me, but they were my two lowest points, the first anniversary and, and the overdose. Um, you gave me this one. I just put it up on the screen. You might like to read that, Rhonda. Oh, yeah. I knew after that moment I would never be the same. Everything had changed and I could never be repaired. That day would be inside me for the rest of my life. And that is so true. Because the media still contact me. You know, it does not go away. With a couple of exceptions. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was only one thing that came good out of the media. There was only one incident. Uh, was the Herald Sun, because back then it was called the Herald Sun in Melbourne. And... Uh, they rang me up and they said, we'd like to take you, hire a plane and take you for a flight over Cape Otway. And the search at the time, I think, was still going on. It was t towards the end. And they said, we know that you were pushed out of Apollo Bay. We'll, we'll hire a plane. We'll take you down there. We'll fly over and no questions asked. And I go, you sure? <laughs> you know, like, and they said, no, we're not going to ask you any questions. We'll take a photo of you looking out of the plane, you know, and that may be in the paper, but we're not going to ask you any questions. We want to do this for you. So that, that was really nice of them to do that. And they came, picked me up in a taxi, took me to Moorabbin, uh, hired a plane, and we went down there and we flew for two hours. And that would have cost <laughs> a lot of money, the taxi even, and... You know, so, and then we came back. They gave me some binoculars to look because I didn't, couldn't search when I was down there. So they said, have a look, you know, and maybe just make me feel better. And we came back. So that, that was really nice of them to do that. And my mum ended up writing a letter, which I still have, um, to the Herald Sun, thanking them for doing that. There was only one proviso, a photo. A photo, yeah. But they didn't interview me no. on the plane, which was really good. Yeah, just took a photo 
of me looking out the plane. So, yeah, for their newspaper. Henry Zips. Oh, yes. Amazing. Um, now, that's one thing I didn't look up when it was. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, later on, this is well after Fred went missing. Um, you know, Mita was still contacting me. I was in every magazine, newspaper, documentary, TV show, whatever. But anyway, um, Henry Seps. Seps. Now, anyone know the show Mother and Son? He was the dentist, the brother. Okay. Well, he did a one-man play about Fred and Guido. And it only showed in Melbourne and was never filmed. So you had to go to the play. And an amazing man. Um, before the play went to the stage, he rang up. I was working in the Australia Post then. And uh, he rang up and he asked my boss if he could take me for the day. And he said, I'll pay for her wage for the day. So no, you know, cost to you, whatever. And a uh, taxi turned up, took me, took me to the theatre where he was going to have this play. Shh, oh, you know, I sat there with Henry for two hours in the seats, looking at the stage, chatting, just talking about the whole thing. It was a great day. He was so nice to me. Um, anyway, he ended up giving me four tickets for the first night and then two tickets for every night that it was on after that. The play was called Sky, and Hen it was a one-man play. So Henry uh, it represented Guido and how Guido felt losing a son, and it was a brilliant play. And the first night I went to the play, um, there was a few things he said that just got to me, you know, like personal sort of that made me upset and I started crying. I was in the front row and I started crying. Henry stopped the play. This one man play, he stopped the play, came down and made sure I was okay. And I was okay then. And then he continued on with the play. And then every night after that, um, I had, well, that night and every night after that, I went to every show, but I had drinks with Henry after the show every night. And yeah, it was a wonderful experience, but a wonderful play. He did such a good job. So I have here, that is the, we didn't get it onto um, a slide or anything, but that's, uh, that's Guido holding Fred's. Yeah. I've got a photo of that after, yeah. Oh, you have got oh, photos Guido, of it, yeah. yeah. But not of Sky. Yeah, um, that's, that says about the play, um, and it was, uh... It was a great experience for you. Yeah, and that's it there, the tickets to the play, to the play, sorry, the tickets to the play. Rhonda, then 20 years later, this photo was taken. Tell us what happened oh. there. <laughs> this is um, the plaque we have down at Cape Otway. Um, it was put there on the 20th anniversary. Um, Guido had a word, Steve had a word, you know, and there was a fair few people there. And Steve Roby unveiled the plaque. And it's still there, down there at Cape Otway. And, um, I go every 10 years, sit at the plaque, sometimes cry at the plaque, you know, and Guido, well, he'd go every year, and some of the family sometimes went with him on some of those trips. But yeah, that's the plaque that we... Ah, that oh, that, that's when they were laying, uh, laid the plaque and they were going to unveil it. And this is... Guido. And that is... Steve Roby. Yeah. <laughs> 
he was the flight service unit operator that was on the other end of the microphone. And yeah. He's very closely connected to this. Yeah, he's very close to me. Really good guy. Yeah. That's the plaque that we laid for Fred and facing in the direction that he flew off from Cape Otway. So it's down there if anyone's ever down that way. And I've had a lot of personal friends that have gone there to have a look at it for me and taken a photo and sent it to me. So, which is very nice. Who are these people? <laughs> That's Alberta, Guido, and the two twins. And that was before Fred went missing. So they were only four years old. And when you, when they, when Fred went missing, how did oh. they react? I went around there not long after Fred went missing and pretty much we all sat there and cried. <laughs> and anyway, the twins, the twins asked me what I had done with Freddie. Because every time we went out, I would be with him, you know, and uh, they said, where have you taken him and please bring him back? You know, and of course that upset me, but Alberta explained, you know, to the twins, they're four years old, you know, and they thought I'd taken him away and had not bring, brought him back home. And they're now 50. That was hard. And they're now 50. They're 50 years old. They're now. 50, yeah, they're 50 years old. That to me is a haunting photograph of a father wondering where his son is. Yeah. That was pretty much after it happened. Guido was a lovely man, absolutely lovely man. And we lost him in? 2000 to cancer. And he was 68, 68, 69 years of age. Yeah, I think. This photo, Rhonda. That was a few years ago when I went down to visit Alberta. Fred's so, mum. Fred's mum. Lovely photo. I've been in um, contact with the family the whole time. I've been to the, both the twins' weddings. Uh, yeah, and um, it's hard sometimes when I see Ricky because Ricky looks like Fred and talks like Fred. So I still see Ricky, but it's hard sometimes for me because well, it's just like Fred. And um, yeah, twins are grown up, have their own families now, and. But I've kept in touch with all of them all this time. I might take the video microphone back. Thanks, Rhonda. When I met Rhonda, I'd always wanted to meet her. And I rang, made some communications with Victoria, trying to get hold of... Oh, and I got onto Steve Roby. And... Uh, and finally I met Rhonda and I saw the most meaningful tattoo I've ever seen in my lifetime. When I sat down, I got goosebumps on this. VHDSJ, 21st of October 1978, 7, 7 p.m., 12 minutes past, 28 seconds, and that was the time of uh, Fred's last radio communication. And I got goosebumps when I saw that, just thinking what Rhonda's gone through, what loss she suffered, and... Uh, and this hot it's like a memorial for me, the yeah. same with the plaque, because you, you have nothing. You can't go to a grave or... Oh, Rhonda, when there's no body, seven years, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you have to wait seven years before you can... Uh, claim anything. Claim anything. Bank, Bank accounts, accounts anything. anything. You're not dead until the yeah. body's missing seven for years. seven years. Yeah. So... This photo here, I think, is a lovely photo. This Steve Roby, the flight service unit operator. He was a commercial pilot and instructor, and he's written a thing. I'm, we're going to read it shortly in the, in the conclusion. There's Rondo, and that was a, a meeting at Moorabbin Airport, I believe. One of the, 40 years. 40 years anniversary. <coughs> and, of course, that's in that um, Cafe, Cafe 63 menu. It is not an aircraft. What a... Incredible. 
So the Chariots of the Gods uh, back in 68, that was a very popular book about how do we explain some of these things on this earth? It's quite incredible. It's mind-blowing when you stop and think of it. How do they build these things? And Derek von Daniken was, you know, trying to get people to think. What an incredible thing uh, has happened. Uh, was God an astronaut? <laughs> an interesting thing. Close Encounters of the Third Kite in 1977. Very interesting uh, movie made by Steven Spielberg, but assisted by this bloke, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, official debunker for the American government for about 20 years. He was there to go and debunk every sighting. And you know what? He had like a St. Paul Road to Damascus conversion. He finally turned around and said, I can't do this anymore. There's too much evidence that, that uh, they existed. And this is him in a cameo in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He was the bloke that came up with the, well, the Close Encounters five descriptions. And of the third kind, of course, uh, was the movie. And uh, so he was the fellow that uh, wrote that up. And it was very interesting, Quentin Fogarty was at a, a lunch or a breakfast, or, it was a breakfast, I think, in America, and he sat next to him and he said, why did you change? He said, it was like wearing a tight pair of shoes and I took them off and it felt good. <laughs> you know, there are things I can understand from a pilot's point of view. On the, when I was flying the 737, the last thing you wanted down the back is panic. Same as you know, on a ship, a fire, anything. You don't want panic. You've lost control. And I can imagine the governments don't want people to panic. You remember the War of the World, 1939, that was put on the radio in New York and people panicked because they thought it was really an Asian invasion. The most amazing thing in my 75 years of life was in June, or well, 75 now, 71 back then, I suppose. In June uh, 2021, the US government finally admitted that UFOs do exist. We don't know what they are or where they come from. Amazing. Yeah. So what could that admission mean, re the disappearance of Frederick? Quite a, quite a statement. And yet they were going to have a two-year investigation and all they came out with is we have no proof that they're extraterrestrial. But they have admitted, because they've got it on video from fighter planes and things from 2004, 2014. And then you come up with this one. I wanted to believe, but then the government said they were real. Because <laughs> we are a bit sceptical how we are manipulated by governments. There's uh, from an F-18 locked onto a UFO. They had a thing off a warship, um, they were doing a, a military practice, and they had a se the, the jet fighters had a secret rendezvous point 60 miles away. The UFOs disappeared, they flew to the, six the, pil the pilots flew to the 60 mile point, they got there and the UFOs were waiting for them. I don't know. It's out of this world, isn't it? This bloke, uh, very imposing looking gentleman and he was the um, Battle of Britain uh, British Air Chief Marshal and Head of Fighter Command at, Battle, um, at um, the Battle of Britain uh, sort of saved England at that point and this is what he said in 1995 when the term flying saucers dominate, dominated popular discussion of the subject one of Britain's greatest airmen Air Chief Marshal Lord Dowding put the problem this way. I have never seen a flying saucer, he wrote, and yet I believe that they exist. I've never seen Australia, and yet I believe that Australia also exists. My belief in both cases is based upon cumulative evidence in such quantity that, for me at any rate, it brings complete conviction. Others have not been so open-minded. When I found that, I thought, what a statement from this bloke. 
Yeah, incredible. So I'm just going to move over here because I asked Steve Roby, really good guy, great supporter of Rhonda's over many years now, to write what he thought. And he said, we're coming up to the 45th anniversary of the disappearance of Frederick Valentich, Rhonda Rushton, Fred's fiance, to be at the time of his disappearance, and Paul Spottiswood, an ex-airline pilot, who've, who has a keen and genuine open-minded interest in the UFO phenomenon. Both asked me if I would put down in writing how I feel about Fred's disappearance today. Had any of my thoughts or feelings changed over all these years. When I formed my view of this incredible incident back in 1978, I took into consideration many factors which led me to a belief that Frederick did not stage his disappearance, that he did encounter something that still today cannot be explained. At the time and pr prior to and after Fred's disappearance, there was a high level of UFO activity. The fact that there was this higher than normal UFO activity prior to his disappearance, to a degree shows it was not a media generated beat up, but a real, in inverted commas, higher than normal, end of inverted commas, level of activity. This real increase in activity was also shown to be the case when about a week after the Valentich incident, I was, while on duty, involved directly in a second UFO report from an instructor and his student conducting NAVAID training over East Sale AIDS. This level of activity was a significant factor in the formation of my belief. Other things I considered were, Fred was a young man working towards his ambition of being a commercial pilot and having a career in aviation. He and Rhonda were planning their engagement to be married. Why would a young person jeopardise all of this with a hoax? Guido and Alberta, Fred's mother and father, invited me to their home for a meal and a talk. The grief and the confusion was palpable, particularly with Guido. He was a good man and a good father, and through the years refused to give up the hope of ever seeing his son again. Fred came from a solid, loving family. I got to know Paul New Norman well. He had the intelligence and the drive not only to look at the Valentich case, but others, which we talked about in a very analytical way. He also had good understanding and maybe a degree of contempt for how the media work. Through Paul, a voice stressed, through Paul, a voice stress test was carried out on the recording of my communication with Fred and a photo analysis uh, was made of the ascending low level cloud in Manifold's photos. Both tests carried out in the USA. Paul came to visit me to tell me the results. I remember the conversation well. Fred was under stress, which I already knew, remembering the way he spoke and the photo analysis in one of the processes showed an aerofoil shaped object with a small notch out of it. I presume its tail in the center of the cloud. It's amazing how polarizing an event like this can be. I remember Alberta, Fred's mum, saying how their family had been changed so much by this event and that they had lost a lot of friends. But, I, but I, th I think she also believed that the friendships of those who stayed with them got even closer. I still feel sorrow for the family today. The loss they have suffered has been made uh, that much harder to bear 
because of the incident's controversial nature. Along with Fred's disappearance, DSJ or parts of thereof have not been found. An extensive search by civil and military fixed and rotary aircraft found nothing. This is unusual, particularly after all these years. A number of years later, a couple came forward to tell me of their sighting of a light aircraft in the vicinity of where DSJ would have been at the time. This aircraft was being followed closely by a strange object. Apart from this, nothing new has been revealed. Early in the years following Fred's disappearance, I had some interesting discussions with various people who had had their own personal experiences. They tended to see me as a person they could tell their story to with a sympathetic ear. This account covers the main reasons why back then I quickly formed the opinion that Frederick Valentic was genuine, a person caught up in a very frightening an extremely mysterious event. I feel, even more today, that what he reported was real. How he sounded, the obvious stress in his voice, the way he was describing a quickly changing scheme, scene, I pictured him looking frantically around for this fast moving object. This was not a hoax. These are my main reasons why how I have consistently held the same belief over the years. Stephen Roby. Well, that, what more can you say? Here's the guy on the other side of the microphone. A commercial pilot, an instructor, he knows what this fellow is going through. So what are we left with? A mystery. The world's, is it Australia's or the world's greatest aviation mystery? I pose this question. Charles Kingsford Smith, Friday the 8th of November, age 38, apparently hit the top of an island off, uh, an uncharted island, three o'clock in the morning, off Burma. A wheel of that aeroplane washed up on the beach. It's now in the Sydney Powerhouse Museum, not far away. So he's in the drink. Amelia Earhart. Friday the 2nd of July 1937, age 39. Um, they think they might have even located her aircraft with electronically about five, six months ago. Uh, we've got Frederick Valentich, nothing. Malaysian 370, a big flapper on, bigger than that table, uh, floated up on Reunion Island, so we know that's certainly in the water. We don't know why it's in the water, but nothing had a radio call like Frederick Valentich had made. So Rhonda and I were saying, well, this is certainly Australia's greatest aviation mystery, but I think possibly the world's, because of the radio call. It went worldwide. It went worldwide. It went worldwide, but, it's, but there's never been another disappearance like that with a radio call that I'm aware of. So is the disappearance of Frederick Valentich Australia or the world's greatest aviation mystery? This, this cartoon with something with two little green objects in it uh, and they're saying, the officials are saying it's a weather balloon. Naturally there was a bit of scepticism among the media regarding the official Air Force explanation. Okay. So that's the presentation today. Is there anything else we yeah, want, I need? Yeah, just to mention something. Rhonda, there we go. To do with, I told you about the play, Sky, that, that happened, that which, which was really good. And also there was um, a documentary called Something Shining, and it was by Robert Alcock. And um, it was, Australian Mosaic series, uh, 1989 on SBS TV. Uh, you still can find that on um, the internet somewhere. It's called Something Shining, and it's a very good documentary. I won't promote the ones that are, you know, make it up as they go after I tell them my story. 
and also um, Guido was on the Don Lane show. You can find that on the internet, his interview. And there was also a Japanese documentary. I've never been able to find it, but they came over from Japan. None of them could speak English. They had an interpreter, <laughs> and they gave us all gifts, you know, when they came. But they did a big documentary. I have been able to find it, but they interviewed everyone that was involved in the whole thing. So that may be out there. I don't know, but it, it would be hard to find that one. But apparently it was made. And to just conclude, uh, we've gone through a lot of things. Um, so I just made a list of, you know, and I, I called it the junk, but uh, the scrapbook, uh, the newspaper clippings that they said, Fred, you know, this is just things that have been written or said or whatever. Uh, which uh, Fred and his mum, yes, they did see a UFO, if you hear that. Um, there's a lot about him picking up friends. Well, he wasn't picking up friends. He was going there just to get flight hours. Simple as that. The crayfish I've explained, you know. It got late, he knew that he wouldn't be able to get the crayfish by then. And Venus, if you hear about that, well, Venus hadn't risen the time for it flew over so I think we covered all that but yeah it's a lot of things out there that have said it's just not true